And now a bonus episode of Pod Crash, where you'll hear... He looks like he has Botox, before Botox. It's literally like Matchbox cars it's, going through a, oh, a, a tube. There's so much sex in this movie. I saw this movie when I was a kid. Futuristic indoor mall of the future. Wait. We're escaping the dome cities through the orgy room. And conquest the planet of the apes. It's like, yeah. Uh, no. It's summer movies of the past on Pod Crash. <laughs> Welcome to the show. A bonus edition of Pod Crash this week. Uh, that's right. Um, and, and for a couple of reasons. One, I, I really want to get uh, some some of this audio to you of a uh, couple of appearances I did on Proudly Resents, where I talked about some summer movies of the past. Uh, and I was, actually, Proudly Resents is the first uh, first podcast that was on Pod Crash. And uh, I sat down with Adam Spiegelman to talk. We were just supposed to talk about one movie, and we ended up talking for like over two hours, and he split it up into three episodes of his, his podcast, so, so I'm kind of doing the same. I'm, well, I'm combining two into one. So we're going to talk about some summer movies of the past. I, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, also, E3 is this week, the Electronic Entertainment Expo at the L.A. Convention Center. I'm going to make it down there, uh, but there's no DVD Day this week on Attack of the Show. Uh, a lot, lots going on. Uh, it may sound a little echoey here. It's because I'm in the middle of moving. So more on that when it's funny. Right now it's not that funny. I'm having to deal with a lot of moving and a lot of life change. So fun. Actually, so not fun when it's happening. But also, I, I screwed up some of, my, some of my plugs, actually, in the earlier Linoleum Knife uh, podcast. So let me get right to those. Let me get to the correct versions of those plugs before we move on. Um, I'm doing two shows this week as part of the L.A. Improv and Comedy Festival Comic Book Live uh, which is Thursday, June 7th at 11.30 p.m. Also doing Glory Stories on Saturday, June 9th at 10.30 p.m. Both shows are at IO West in Los Angeles at 6366 Hollywood Boulevard. You can get more info at facebook.com slash podcrash. Also doing a live podcrash, uh, Crashing Defective Geeks. That's Saturday, June 23rd at 7 p.m. at the Comic Bug in Manhattan Beach. Um, admission is free. You can get more information, facebook.com slash podcrash. And I'm going to be doing uh, DC Pearson's uh, stand, uh, stand-up show, at the, the Little Modern. And you've got to see his movie, Mystery Team. Look that one up. That's Sunday, June 24th, 8 p.m. at 6476 Santa Monica Boulevard in Hollywood. Get more info at thelittlemodern.com. And uh, we just announced a live podcrash at Comic-Con in San Diego, Thursday, July 12th. Uh, that's going to be awesome. And that's going to be like a double because uh, Comics on Comics is also going to be live right after my podcast. Maybe we, can, maybe we can join forces like the Avengers. Okay, speaking of the Avengers, um, I, I'm sure you've all seen it by now, so there's no spoilers. Okay, the Avengers win in the end. There's the big thing. But I, I was lucky enough to actually see uh, the Avengers at the Catalina Film Festival in May, uh, and it was hosted by Stan Lee. And Stan Lee uh, gave a, a little speech before, and then he also, I also had the opportunity to host a Q&A with uh, Stan Lee about uh, POW Entertainment, his new company. And I, I promised you guys some clips. So here's some little highlights and, and, and some of the stuff that Stan Lee had to say at the panel. Some really good stuff. The audio's not so great, but, uh, but, but Stan ha- has a lot of fun stuff to say. Give it a listen. Have you ever questioned your, uh, your profession, the profession that you chose? Or did have, it, ever, have you ever questioned the profession you chose? Did you ever think of maybe giving up on things? Do, doing something other than writing comics? I never wanted to be a comic book writer. <laughs> I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a writer, but I never thought of comics. I figured I'd be the world's greatest novelist one day. I wanted to be an advertising man. I wanted to be a general. If I couldn't be a general, I wouldn't join the army. And um, there was a time when I wanted to... I, if you saw the documentary, it's probably in there, and I don't want to bore you, but... I wanted to quit because I wasn't happy with the stories my publisher was getting me to write. He didn't want anything. He thought that comics were read by little kids or stupid adults. So he didn't want any words of longer than two syllables. He didn't want me to worry about characterization or plot. Just give me a lot of action, action, action. And I did it because it was a job, but I hated it. So one day I said, I think I'll quit to my wife. And she said... Well, instead of quitting, why don't you do one book the way you'd like to do it? 
The worst that can happen, you'll get fired, but so what? You want to quit anyway, at least you'll get it out of your system. And that's when they did the Fantastic Four, which was a little bit different than the comics had been until then. Luckily, the book sold, so I stayed there ever since. But at that time, I was ready to quit. I have no idea what I would have done if I quit. I uh, might have ended up being a homeless man. I don't know, but I would, I would have tried for something else. Just to explain, uh, so I'm doing this Q and A at the Catalina Film Festival, and and Stan's a little hard of hearing. So when I'm when I'm I'm repeating the question normally, which is either a question from the audience or a question that I had for him, and then uh, th- th- one of the guys there just repeated uh, the questions to Stan. Here's where he talks about uh, Marvel versus DC. Stan, do you see any possibility of a DC universe crossover with Marvel characters in a movie, other than perhaps your cameo in a Batman film, which would be awesome, by the way. We did that uh, in comics. Oh, we did it in comics years ago, and boy, it took a lot of doing. But I made a deal with the DC company, which was then known as National Comics, to do a Superman Spider Man battle. And uh, it was published, made a lot of money. That's the only time I know of that we've cooperated. I think that a movie in which the DC characters fought our characters would be very intriguing to the fans. I don't know what chance their characters would have against that. <laughs> I'll tell you something funny. Did you ever wonder how Superman flies? I mean, the man has no visible means of propulsion. He just puts his hands like this, and off he goes. Maybe if we could learn to put our hands like this, <laughs> we could all fly. But that's another subject. I don't think there's really much chance of the two companies getting together with a movie. Anything is possible, but I really wouldn't expect that to see. To, I would expect to see that for quite a long time. Well, you know, you also wrote those 12 or 13 books for oh, DC. That's right. And I think you really scared them at that point. Yeah, they asked me to do a series a few years ago. I forget the exact name, something like... What if Stan Lee had created Superman, or what if Stan Lee had created Batman? I did about 12. There was Wonder Woman, the Green Lantern, whatever. And they were damn good. But there was nothing DC could do with them after they published them and they sold, because they weren't about to change the way their characters were and do them the way... Because I made them all different. I made Batman a black man who had been in jail and he got out of jail. And, uh, I don't know. Every one of them was totally different than the way DC did it. I thought it was better. And, uh, but anyway, if you get a chance, get a hold of some of those books. I think you get a kick out of them. And I'm saying that selflessly because I don't even get a royalty. <laughs> I think I heard somebody yell out, Just Imagine. Was that the, the title of the book? Just Maybe. Imagine. I don't remember. Yeah. Something like that. I think there was actually a, a, a Marvel crossover with DC, wasn't there? I mean, the, 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 look, they're crossing over with Capcom characters, you know, Street Fighter. I mean, who, you know, who, who can, I, I, I don't know. That kind of stuff doesn't in, interest me that much. But uh, this, this was paired with a documentary uh, that was about Stan at the Catalina Film Festival. So we saw the Avengers and then this, this documentary. And uh, he, 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 Stan actually talked about having a cameo in a Batman film earlier that that i thought was funny uh, that would be because uh, i asked him what his favorite cameo was and he wouldn't actually say but uh, okay here's some more what do you think about this there are real life superheroes in places like san diego and other cities and they patrol the streets they're not so much vigilantes but people dressed in costume doing good things around the country this, this is a real trend yeah. what do i think about ordinary people putting on costumes i don't like it <laughs> Not because of any competition they're giving us, but I'm afraid those people are going to get hurt. They don't have superpowers. They're not bulletproof. They're wandering around in costume, making themselves very noticeable. And some bad guy with a gun could just pop up and shoot them. Or, I mean, I, I think they're taking too big a risk. Because, again, they may think they look like superheroes, but they don't have any special power. What are, what are they going to do if they really run up against some criminals who are armed? So I, I really worry about them. 
Um, I just want to thank uh, Stan Lee, um, a legend. Everyone, big round of applause. <laughs> There's, there's actually a documentary called Real Life Superheroes. I think, I think it was on HBO, and there's also, um, you can go to reallifesuperheroes.org, which is a directory of all these uh, costumed vigilantes uh, around the United States that have um, dressed in costume to do good. Uh, a couple, cu- couple more uh, clips from Stan. So what superpower would you take, any superpower in the world, and what Marvel villain would you take on with that power? What Marvel, what, what villain would you take on with that power? Well, most of Marvel's villains I made up. <laughs> they are so powerful, no matter what power I had, I wouldn't want to go against them. Because despite how wonderful I may seem to you up here, I'm a big coward. <laughs> and, but as far as the superpower I want, it may surprise you. The power I would pick would be luck. Because if you're lucky, you can get everything. Guy shoots at you, he misses. No matter what happens, you're lucky. So you <laughs> So think about it. The greatest superpower in the world. You want to catch a guy, you catch him because you're lucked out. You want to get the girl, you get her because you're lucky. I like that. Uh, question about the Marvel movies. Do you have a favorite cameo? You know, you've appeared in these Marvel films in some of the funniest moments, touching moments. Do you have a favorite movie cameo that you've done? Every one of my cameos is my favorite cameo. <laughs> you people may think these are just tossed in, you know, just to make me feel good or something. These are so carefully planned. They spend more time worrying about my cameo than writing the screen. <laughs> you should see the conferences, the head of the studio, the head of the distribution company, people from all around the world, chime in. What would Stan's uh, cameo be? And <laughs> I am the biggest liar you've ever met. <laughs> Well, I, I, the way everything seems to be going, certainly the track record of this weekend, I think they're all going to be afraid not to have you do the cameo. The biggest, I just thought, the biggest mistake, the biggest mistake Warner Brothers ever made is not giving me a cameo in a Batman movie. Can you imagine? <laughs> they not only get all the Batman fans, they get all the Marvel fans who wouldn't believe it. They'd have to see for themselves. But don't tell them. I'm not trying to help Warner. That's just between us. <laughs> now that we know there's a lot of fans here, we should tell them that we're starting a campaign with the Academy uh, to create a new category for the best cameo because we're totally convinced there's only one person who could win that, so it's going to be a shoe in So stay tuned for that one. Already written my acceptance. <laughs> and finally, here Stan uh, talks about uh, other Marvel characters and a, a, a submar- a possibility of a Submariner movie. That's, I, I don't know. Would that be any good? I don't know. As good as Aquaman? What, whatever happened to the Submariner? To the what? To the, to the Submariner. Oh, nothing as far as I know. I have to be honest. I did not create Namor. Submariner, but I love that character because he's sort of a good evil character. Sort of like Dylan me, I'm good and easy. Wait a second, wait a second. But this is one guy. <laughs> now, you don't even know who the Submariner is out there. I thought it was a sandwich. Oh, that's he's, submarine. No. <laughs> he's the Prince of Atlantis, and I love writing his story. Sooner or later, the Submariner will be in a movie. I promise you. There are people at Marvel right now going through all our characters saying, who should be the next movie, okay? Maybe it'll be the Black Panther. Maybe after that, Doctor Strange. Maybe, how about Ant-Man? Hawkeye. Well, hey, what about the um, Submariner? How about this one? That? They're not going to let an opportunity go. I just want you all to live long enough and you'll see every character you ever read about in Marvel on the big screen. 
anyways, I, I, Stan joked earlier about uh, get, having an Oscar speech written already. He he certainly deserves it. I mean, when you look at like what he's contributed to film, so many so many movies have been and non non superhero related movies, but movies that have been influenced by Marvel characters in his writing uh, of comic books in the '60s. So. Uh, I, it's, it's, I don't know. I, I just, I love Stan. He's a national treasure and, um, he should, he deserves an Oscar. He does. I mean, I mean, come on, give this guy one. Okay. So let's get to this week's crash. Uh, I was on proudly resents. It was the very first podcast that I pod crashed on, uh, episode one of, of this show. And, uh, I sat down with Adam Spiegelman, uh, to talk. I, I don't know what we were talking about. We just told me, he told me to pick a guilty pleasure movie and I picked Logan's run. Which which we talk about, but it it diverted typical of me into talking about you know twenty different things that he broke up into three podcasts. Uh, so here's 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 here I'm talking about Logan's Run, one of my favorite movies from summer movies past. This was this and Logan's Run opened the year before Star Wars. It was 1976. I saw it in the theater as a kid, and the first time it was the first time actually I remember seeing boobs at the theater, and it was in a PG movie. Okay. Uh, here we go. Our, our first segment of uh, Proudly Resents. Now, I watched Logan's Run. I was like, where is this a bad movie? Well, I, the, I, there's the things thing is, we can make fun of and nitpick, but I thought it was a pretty awesome movie. Well, that's, that's the thing is, is like what, what works about that film to me is the acting. The acting. But if you really think about it for more than two seconds, so much of that movie falls apart. Like, for example... You know, when you start to question it, I mean, and let's actually set aside the fact that so much of it looks cheesy. For example, the special effects are kind of cheesy. Like, oh my god, they're the looks, worst. I mean, it's like it's like a great like model kit. It's like great, like like I love no the model, model kit. kits is literally like Matchbox cars it's, going through a, oh, a, a tube. Well, I love it because in the same way that I love Godzilla with a man in the suit, it's like I love I, like that's a toy set I would like to play with. So I look at Logan's Run. It's like okay, that's the little the domed cities. It's like well, it's it's like a, it's like a train set. It, it looks then, like a Lion, yeah. Lionel train set when they show. And then the a lot of the blue screen effects are very cheap in, in retrospect. Um, the costumes are kind of dumb looking, and also it was shot at a mall in Texas. Which Is that in the night, yes, it was. It was shot at a mall in Texas in the 1970s. This futuristic indoor mall of the future, and that's that's the setting for Logan's Run. Is a is Is a mall in in Dallas, Texas. Is that why there's a Cinnabon? Exactly, there's a Cinnabon in Logan's Run. But but the, the, and and then also if you start to really think about some of this, I mean, no one looks the ages that they're saying in the movie. It makes oh, he's no supposed to be twenty six. He's supposed to be twenty six. And then the other thing is, is that why is it that Jenny Auger's character, you know, Jessica Six, the the, the love yeah, interest, the love interest, um, why does she have a British accent? Did they have British accents in the dome? Did he? But Michael York is. And Michael British. York has a British accent. So, so the, the lead two, is looking is, is Michael York. Well, yes, the two lead actors have British accents, but his best friend, you know, Francis Seven. Doesn't have a British accent. No. So why? Can you explain to me why in the Dome City that well, Logan is... would somehow acquire and then he'd meet some chick uh, who has a, a, a British accent? No, but let's talk about that because okay, uh, okay. if you live in Boston, you can have that awful Boston accent. Right, no offense, right. but seriously, it's awful. Yeah. And then, or you live in, well, I'm from Jersey, you can't help picking up that accent. You live in a Dome City. Yeah. You're going to pick up whatever accent, whatever disease, whatever quirk everyone else has. You're in a, yeah. literally in a Dome. Right. So, so why, why isn't everyone a British accent or everyone of Jersey accents or where? Yeah. How did yeah, he exactly. do that? How, yeah, exactly. How, how, how did he get this British accent? The, the other thing is, here's what I do. I mean, there's things that are cheesy that I like about the film. Um, and one of the things is the, there's so much sex in this movie. I saw this movie when I was a kid. Oh, your was, mind must have been blown. It was the first movie my mom let me go see by myself. So mm-hmm. she dropped me off at the theater. I'll just drop you off and I'll pick you up in a couple hours. I saw the movie and there's there's like I mean there's full full nude back Jenny Auger who I was in love with who also gets naked in American Werewolf in London. Additionally, there's like an orgy room where they go through. Great. They have to escape. Wait. We're escaping the dome cities through the orgy room <laughs> where there's like people naked and they're only covered by clouds, but they're fully naked, boning in this orgy room. The other thing is. Logan finds Jessica Six by basically using what I would say is the future of the internet. It was the it was the internet. It was the internet. He's like, it was like dialing. Match. Her. It was like match. dot com. He's like, you know, he's, he's like in tuning. his bedroom. He's like, I'm horny, and, and I'm horny. really jerking off. 
Let me, and he, yeah, he's got some dial I'm or something. This, yeah, I'm in this horrible moo moo, and I'm going to dial. He's got like a thing that he's dialing, like like one of those really old TV remotes, right? Yeah. So he's so he's sitting there dialing, Long and walks. he brings up, he's bringing up like this whole thing, and a guy comes on, and they look at each other like they shrug, like, hmm, guess we're not gay. <laughs> I'm not into dudes. So, um, wrong he, he, number, Charlie. Exactly, wrong. Exactly. And of course, it's like typical because the internet, what happens is you could be flirting someone and chat, whatever, and it's a dude. Oh. Think about that. It is a dude. So, so that, that thing actually happened before the internet was even invented. Uh, the, Logan's Run predicted that dudes would put themselves What's on the internet. What's that thing called? Um, where you can instant chat? Uh, yeah. roulette chat, chat roulette, roulette. Chat it roulette. was like yes. chat roulette yes it yeah. was like chat roulette so so suddenly uh the chat so ch- the chat roulette um happy finally he brings up jessica six and she's you know she's wearing this thing that where she's got no underwear around and the sides of her outfit are it, uh, they're com- it's completely exposed i mean it's so, she's basically wearing this negligee that's so freaking hot that's my dream halloween costume no, by but the way you know what that is, is to for actually you? Be, Logan, I want to get a chick because I love to do couples costumes. I've, I've always wanted to find a girl who would be. I'd be Logan, and she'd be Jessica. We well, got the saran wrap last year. That's almost like leading up. Yeah, to I it. know. I think I could just. But we would be it the costume. Honey. No one would know who we are. No, no one would also, know. Also, it would be really, really distracting. All night, guys would be playing side boob roulette. Like, side boob roulette. Yeah, but I mean, but I. That's so, why I did the whole movie. I don't know. You were thirteen. I would have. That's the only oh, thing God. I would have thought. I. Of. I the, the thing is, is I. Uh, God, I love Halloween because it brings out every woman's inner slut. I love there is slutty cowboy, there is, like, the there is a there's, there's I mean every outfit for chicks is a slutty this, a slutty that. There is not a there's everything is a slutty everything. One slutty year, none. Was- here's here's the trick. I'll recommend Logan's Run to someone who's never seen Logan's Run, and then they see the movie, and they're like, eh, the effects sucked, and this, and blah, blah. And it's because, you know, I, I guess our movie-going language, just as, as an audience, has, is more sophisticated today. We're a more sophisticated audience. Well, they didn't care. I, it felt like they didn't care that we would care whether or not it was fake. Well, it looks so fake when they show the Dome City from above. Right. It does look like a train it, set. It looks cheesy, but also, like, the original Superman looks really bad, some of those uh, effects. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I think all like before Derek CGI. Mettings. They, like they, they look like little toys. But even CGI to me just looks like a video game. I, uh-huh. you know, when I see CGI stuff, it's like, that's a very good video game. Well, we're used to, Logan goes into a computer and gets an assignment that he has to find a sanctuary, but he also finds out his dot on his hand is blinking red, yes. that he's going to die, and now he's freaking out. Yeah. It's totally believable, yeah. even though the idea is absurd. And yeah, it's totally... He goes through change, too. You know, first he starts off like, okay, maybe I'll go do what this computer says. And of course, like, like all computers in the future, a hot female voice. Yes. Logan, approach, identify. I love it. And then he goes, hello. Yes, he's talking to the hot female computer voice. Yeah, hey, why? Yeah. Well, if you're going to talk to someone, and see, that's another thing they predicted. You talked about how they look. Logan uh, Michael York, supposed to be 30 or 26 at the time. He looks like he has Botox before Botox. He uh, looks... Oh, I love Michael York. That's a guy that's never aged. He sort of came out of the womb fully Michael York. But, um, yeah, I mean, he looks like he's probably like 35 in the movie, but he's supposed to be playing 26. He looks like... But his face is so tight. It looks like he's Michael York is wearing a Michael York mask. Yeah. And what's funny is he looks exactly the same in the Austin Powers films, you know, as Austin <laughs> Powers' does. boss. He looks exactly the same. He plays a... Was it Nigel Exposition? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just... So you, the younger the younger listeners, or not so younger, if you watch uh, Logan's Run in relation to the 70s, you, you forgive a lot, a lot of the special effects, uh, including they meet a robot named Box. They, Box. They, so, Box. Um, <laughs> well, Michael York and... Uh, Jenny Auguter is the actress. The love Jessica. interest. They're on the run now, and they're trying to get... To sanctuary, right. and they go through all different worlds. Which is, uh, they had a TV show based on it where they would travel different worlds. So, they're in a world of ice world, and comes out the the cheapest special effects. It's uh, almost like they put a, uh, a garbage can on a guy, cut whole arm holes. I mean, and almost like he looks, exactly he looks like a like, vacuum cleaner. He looks like he's yeah, basically he's like a Roomba arms. with a head. He's like a <laughs> Roomba the, with arms and a head, and then he so he, he roll he wheels out and then starts and and basically. Um, uh, they're naked because they've just come through the water. So now well, they, they've come through the water and they that? put on this fur and they're just sitting there and the music kind of changes the tone. It's so bizarre. And and he comes out and starts, oh, look at this. Look at my birds are singing and whatnot. And then and then he, his, his whole job is to freeze them because this is how this is how food actually comes to the... He's, he's one of the robots that takes care of the food that comes into the city. But but suddenly he's, he's now freezing them. I mean, what was his whole story? 
I don't know, maybe Makes he's no feeding sense. them. Yeah, maybe he's feeding them food. He looks like a cheap Tin Man from a, a local production of Wizard of Oz. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't look so bad, but I mean, it does look it the design does. of it. The Come design on. of it is kind of cheesy because he's rolling. He definitely looks like a vacuum cleaner. He, he sounds like an old Jewish comedian. Yeah. It's like a Borscht Belt comedian in a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. All right, yeah. ready? I'm gonna freeze you. Yeah. I'm gonna put you in the frozen and the popsicle <laughs> and the thing. Uh, uh, but Logan is the only runner that's come through that has a gun. So because he has a gun, he is able to defeat Box and actually exit the city. He's the only person that's ab- been able to actually exit the city and go to the outside world. Oh, so that's why all the other runners end up there with end up a there, robot named Box. And they end up frozen, them. and there's like this whole hall corridor of, of naked, fro- naked frozen bodies. There's, there's so much nudity in Logan's yeah. run. Just for the full – and the, the fact that it's sort of like, eh, it's this fanciful kid sci-fi movie. There is a ton of nudity and sex in this movie that is just unbelievable. There's a, there's a scene actually – even like after after Logan like uh, you know sort of finds Jessica on whatever their internet is or or whatever dials her in this transporter um, his buddy his roommate Francis Seven who's also a Sam that comes with two chicks two hot chicks and they're gonna have an orgy and he throws up some ball that's got this horny gas that comes down I mean it's just you just sort of accept it and the way it's played it's played so straight yeah this it's is not, the way it's done it's not played salaciously it's played like this is how we interact socially yeah and so, so I, I think that it's such a subtle thing, and to me, it's also the thing that when you when you see like a a, a new director, like you'll see it like a, a film festival or whatnot. Like I have the opportunity to see, you'll see the ones that really pull it off are the ones that create a world that you just believe. You don't have to have good special effects to make something that's effective. Maybe this is against this whole proudly resents. So the, I, I wrote a note box, the robot that we're saying the the old Jewish guy in a vacuum cleaner. He checks out the woman's ass. At some point. He does? Yeah, he just kind of goes, ooh. ooh. Well, it's, ooh. well, it's unbelievable to me that there was, I mean, they stripped down, I mean, I don't know if they had that sort of like, I just don't think they cared. I think they just took their clothes off, and that's just the easier, easier way of shooting it. They put that sort of like a thing like right in front of your genitals when they shoot nude things right. with actors, isn't it? Like something. A, a cock sock. A little, is it a cock sock or a little thing like. Yeah. Uh, a sack yeah. sack. Yeah, something, something. They put something just sort of, uh, just to make you. Not feel so self conscious, right? But um, yeah, yeah, she's just uh, she seems it unabashed. Funny, it was a funny thing. They swim, they come up, and he goes, "We have to take our clothes off." Yes. She goes, okay, <laughs> let's take our clothes off before they freeze on us. Uh, I mean, that's like that to me. Try that line out on a chick. Just walk up to a bar. Let's take our clothes off before they freeze on us. Ow! <laughs> I just get smacked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I, just uh, I just I love just the lines that are just so ridiculous, but. No one, and uh, you know, well, now, are they quoting movies is popular among movie geeks. No one quotes Logan's Run except for me. <laughs> that would be a good one. I, I, I am literally an outcast among misfits. I, I find myself <laughs> constantly. You, you can't be accepted by your own. Company. No, no, no. So, so Logan's Run is a, a personal favorite of mine. I know they've talked about. Uh, They've talked about remaking it at some point. I mean, there was some remake in the works, but it's interesting because it, it's really motivated me to read that book when I was a kid, which is it's a totally different thing. Anyways, okay, well, we talked about, a lot about that in there. I, I, it's, it's just, this is before summer movies was a thing, and, and, and Logan's Run really impacted my summer, even with its flaws. And I think I noticed a lot of those flaws back when I saw it, but, but it's also, it's a, just a personal favorite of mine. And then the Planet of the Apes films were a huge favorite of mine, um, as a kid, and of course, there's there's been the new resurgence, the new Planet of the Apes, and um, Adam and I talked about that. So, so here's another couple segments where we talk about uh, the Planet of the Apes as a series, and then also the new Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and of course, there is a sequel coming. There is a sequel coming to Rise of the Planet of the Apes. A sort of new re. They're they're rebooting everything. Let's ju- let's just get used to that. Okay. So, all right, back to proudly resents and some. Planet of the Apes. This pre- Planet of the Proudly Resents. That's what this is. So, do you see the rise of the Planet of the Apes? I was not. A, I, I'm not a big fan of that movie. I, I, I know love that. Movie. Everybody loves it. But let me tell you, what do you think about the? Let's just talk about the effects, and we'll go back okay. to Logan's Run. The, the, this is the opposite of Logan's Run. Okay, opposite of Logan's Run. Now we have digital effects. Yeah, we have entire apes. We have like ten thousand apes, all CGI. That ape uh, through the whole movie is CGI. Yeah, and yeah. he gets wet. You didn't believe that when he got wet. No, no. I, 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 my issue with Rise of the Planet of the Apes has nothing to do with the effects. I think the effects are spectacular. I think um, I, I, I don't know if this is an Oscar-winning uh, motion capture performance by Andy Serkis, but um, if the Academy somehow decides like to create a, a special award for that at some point, maybe Andy Serkis will get that at the end of his career. 
Um, I'm not sure that that's a talent that's specific enough. Like you know, best foley. They don't have. Uh, there's great foley in a lot of movies. Yeah. Transformers three, great foley. But I don't know if that rec- you know. You so know, who's also good as uh, the guy who played Silver Surfer. Oh, um, that, that was Doug. That was Doug Jones actually. Yeah, he did. Um, he was great. He was in Hellboy. He's one of those that's great. Yes. Oh God, he's in Hellboy. And Doug Jones has this weird. I mean, if you meet him in real life, he looks like Jack Skellington. He has this body that is wiry, and he is. Um, if I may put a shout out to Doug, Doug Jones, just a tremendous talent. He and Andy Serkis, they're like specialized guys. That I, I I just wonder because the pool of talent you just you just keep giving that award if they created a motion capture to, to those guys it just be it just go to the same people it's like ILM every year getting the you know getting the award for best special effects or it's like Pixar almost every year getting the award for the best animated feature it's it's but Rise of the Planet of the Apes my issue with Rise of the Planet of the Apes has nothing to do with the uh, digital effects, the motion capture I think I think that they're they're getting close I mean to me I think when it was a little baby monkey it looked a little little fakish, but I'll buy it. I, I will buy, I mean, also when you look back at the original Planet of the Apes, okay, you buy that those are monkeys? I mean, it's those cheesy guys makeup. Masks. Yeah, they, they're, they're not, the, the articulation is not really there in terms of an animal, but but you buy it. I mean, you buy into whatever the standard is. The, the, whoever the director, the visionary, the, the producers, the, the creative forces behind, the, they're creating their own set of rules, and you buy into those rules, and if they break their own rules, that's where films go off the rails. But, but uh, um, Logan's wrong, because you, you're right. In that theory, yes, you see like the cheap special effects or the, t- right. the toy train and you're like they don't who gives a shit yeah exactly you the just you just buy into it you just buy yeah. it it doesn't matter to me the, the the reason i think logan's run works at the end of the day is because of the performances the, the actors and it really goes to show that that the actors sell a special effect not the special effect i know george lucas has said that for years but it's not about the effect it's the reaction of a human face to a, a digital effect but rise of the planet of the apes was amazing for that I think that you see that you know Andy Serkis as Caesar outacts James Franco, <laughs> you know an Oscar nominated actor, which is amazing. But we're by the way, Andy Serkis as the monkey is hosting the Oscars next year. Oh my! See now that would be that, that, that's also a way that he could uh, outperform uh, James Franco. But but um, I, where Rise of the Planet of the Apes failed for me, and I think that this is a failing of many modern science fiction movies, is that. It did not have a deeper theme or social or political commentary that made the movie relevant because I ask, I would ask every executive in Hollywood who is considering a reboot of a franchise, I would ask a very simple question, why? Why are you rebooting it? Why? What do you have to say about the world? The original Planet of the Apes movies, the original Planet of the Apes was shocking the, the 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 social and political commentary and really the original one is about white paranoia about black power in the 60s that's what the first planet of the apes is about and each of them kind of addresses youth movement and a, a lot of what was happening in society and what's happening in our world the problem is that the development process in hollywood is 7 years so from the time like a person thinks of a movie to writing it to it's made and it's in theaters that's 7 years and and the way that pop culture and just has evolved with and politics and everything uh, the way we are a society um you can't speak to it's, it's difficult to speak to larger themes i think a, a movie that did it really well most recent movie was the dark knight rises but if you go back and look at the original planet of the apes movies those movies were basically exploitation movies after the first one was like a big budget movie and then after that it was like a horrible i mean uh, you know i s- ended up seeing all of the planet of the apes movies at a drive in my parents took me to a a marathon of all five from dusk till dawn all five Planet of the movies, it was awesome. I loved it as a kid. But um, those movies always played like, it was always in downtown Detroit. It was always never at a theater that was close to me. It was always like these sort of like, they would play the black exploitation movies and then Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. It's like, yeah. And the way, if you look at the old ads for those Planet of the Apes movies, they were made to appeal to an exploitation audience. But if you, if you really look at the, I mean, there are shocking things where there's a, scene in which they've exited the vehicle in the original Planet of the Apes, Charlton Heston and his astronauts. One of the astronauts has died on the ship uh, because there was a crack in the little suspended animation tube. And they, they, they plant a flag, an American flag, against the, the sunlight. And Charlton Heston looks at the American flag and laughs. He laughs and, and mocking, like, that, that doesn't even exist anymore. That country doesn't exist. That piece of cloth is worthless. I mean, here it is, red-blooded American, you know, rep- you know, right-wing Republican Charlton Heston laughing at the image of an American flag and mocking the guy for, for even, I mean, it, it, it attacks um, religion. It turns, you know, like there's this sort of Jesus ape, 
you know, the lawgiver. It's such a radical film in terms of what it says socially and politically. And beneath the Planet of the Apes, they destroy the world with Orson Welles' voice. Then they bring the world back by going back in time. And it's, a lot of it's about animal cruelty. I mean, the Planet of the Apes movie said a lot thematically. And I feel this new one just wasn't, I feel like it needed to make a statement like, the way a film like Fight Club was about so many, um, spoke to what was happening at the time. And a film like, I think, The Dark Knight Rises, or excuse me, The Dark, the Dark Knight, not The Dark Knight Rises, that's coming, coming to a theater near you. Um, but The Dark Knight said so much about our society and just like how, how uh, uh, you know, terrorism has changed this world. I mean, the Joker was a terrorist. Right. And it was Osama bin Laden. Yeah. And the fear of that and how he just basically was there to fuck with them. Yeah. He didn't have any agenda. He was just there to fuck with them. And then, and then given a choice at the end, these two boatloads, one criminal and one citizen, did not destroy each other. They made the correct moral choice. So oh. I, I think it's, it's, it's really, I mean, The Dark Knight, I think, is one of the few genre movies that has, has sort of spoken to the zeitgeist of what's happening in, 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 uh, in society today. Look, I work for a network that, like, you know, all, it's, 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 all, it's all hot female co-hosts. I mean, I'm lucky to still be on Attack of the Show, but I know as soon as there's a hot chick that can talk film, uh, well, you know what? There probably is. Is that why you're getting fake breasts? Yes, exactly. I mean, they're all, it's like, and, and, I, and I, I'm guilty of it, too, because I'll be watching a show. It's like, eh, I'd rather be having a hot chick tell me this. Well, what about sports? But like, I'm weird, not a sports guy, but every sideline reporter is a hot woman. Always now. a hot chick. But it's a weird thing, actually, because I, I, I love to pay attention to weird statistical things um, or, or sort of facts that uh, they throw out in the TV world. You know, one of them is like, well, you're not supposed to have facial hair, you know, and of course, Geraldo Rivera, Rivera broke that. Uh, thing you know you can't you're not have facial hair um and i had facial hair when i started doing tv and i was like well i'm just gonna keep my facial hair i don't care um the other thing was is that uh this is a weird thing that i've heard is that like um men don't like to be they like to get information from dudes like they like to hear someone like me tell them what dvds to right you know they'll let a woman read you the news but they don't want a woman to tell them what to do Whereas my role, no, I'm serious. My role on Attack of the Show is to tell you what to do. I say you should either see this movie or not see this movie or get this DVD or whatnot. So I'm giving advice. I'm telling you, um, you know, and then other, the, all the male roles on the show tell you a tech device. They give you advice. They tell you what to do. All the female roles are just giving information. That's and hilarious. it's a weird, um, it's a weird thing where uh, this is what I've heard anyways. I, I, I don't entirely believe this is true, but... Um, I love I love sort of basking in those statistics and going, eh, it's just going to go away. Uh huh. Well, it, it, it's it's a reality until it becomes an exception. Like right, it's, right. Until the exception comes and then it moves on to the next thing and then it goes away. Exactly. But, but until then, no one's going to change the rules. You know, until I mean, you're D, you keep referring yourself to DYI, which is true. Once you someone else, if a woman does it on her own and breaks the barrier, then all of a sudden everyone has to copy her. But someone else just has to do it. Right. No one's going to say, oh, I'm, I've changed my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it, it's just a weird thing that I think um, a weird, quote, rule that I think TV executives get in their head that becomes a rule because they think of it in their head. When I worked at uh, News, I worked for Inside Edition American Journal back in the 90s. And if I got an expert, like a talk, every news story had to have a talking head who would just and I'm sure you must have got hired for that just to say, oh, blah, blah. if I hired a British person, they would say, no, no, no. British people are only to talk about Princess Diana. And the royals. Otherwise, America tunes out once they hear a British person talk about anything else, films of the week or commercials or anything. So good, you're only allowed to have British accents for the royals. No, but I, I love hearing those weird rules, and then they just, they just, you break them. But it's weird how much discussion goes to the most stupid types of decisions from colors. Like, I know, for example, I can't wear uh, white or light-colored clothes well, that's on my show, and I do. It's a, it's a tech, They say it's a technical thing. And sometimes, it is. Like, it looks I, terrible. Well, well right. it's got to change. Yeah, yeah, Actually, yeah. I take that back. We have digital TVs. It must be better now. It's, yeah, but, but when I started, I, they've it They've loosened big, up yeah. on it, and like, not, like I can't. I have to bring multiple, because I, I, I bring my own clothes on the show. And, um, you know, I can't be wearing the same color shirt as someone else. I just feel like it's just so funny to me the amount of discussion and, and, and thought that goes into the most simple decisions, which is also, I guess, a part of, like, how you can tell something from, uh, you know, something that's professional to something that's maybe not so professional sheen. But I do like sort of a non-professional sheen. I like sort of an off-the-cuff. That's why I like podcasts. That's why... 
That's why I don't prepare at all for my segment on DVD Tuesday. Uh, you no, don't I even prepare. Have... No, I, I watch. I, I, I'm obsessive, actually. I have a DVD. I have a Blu-ray portable DVD player in my car to listen to commentary when I drive. And I have wireless speakers throughout my house, um, including the bathroom, so that when I put on a DVD and it's got, like, commentary, I can listen to it no matter where I walk. Right. Um, I do like one of my favorite commentaries was uh, The Hangover. The commentary for The Hangover, which they actually shot on video, so you can do picture-in-picture picture on a Blu-ray. And, you know, um, of course... Uh, it's uh, the director, you know, it's uh, Bradley Cooper and, and exactly. Zach Galifianakis. And he, of course, famously hates, like, commentary and behind the scenes or any of that stuff. When, when people talk about the process, he hates it. Uh-huh. About 15 minutes into the commentary, um, he says, when are you guys going to shut up and watch the movie? I'm just trying to watch <laughs> the movie. I mean, he's, uh, 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 Zach Galifianakis is great. I hope that his... Uh, his rocketing stardom doesn't ruin the, the essence of what makes him funny. He's great. I got a call from him one day before The Hangover came out and said, uh, we have mutual friends. You know, I know you've done uh, talk show, daytime talk shows and court shows. He said, this movie's coming out, and um, I'm going to become pretty recognizable, which I thought was which he was 100% right, but I was like, oh, screw you. Yeah, but, uh, yeah sure. Okay. Yeah, right, yeah. Zach Galifianakis. And uh, he said, I'm going to become pretty recognizable, so I think it would be awesome if i just showed up at different tv shows in the audience like and i used to do court shows he's like what if i showed up at judge judy and i was just <laughs> sitting in the audience and you just see a guy with a beard oh. and then a year later this big movie comes out <laughs> that's okay that's the genius of zach galvin yeah. like like so did he end up doing it no i put him in touch with someone i want to fucking call him out at the view the view uh the <laughs> audience department was like uh no because there's no guarantees it's gonna get on and they were like, no, go to the PR department. And, they, and the, the shows were just not... But it's like not... you try to explain something that's, a, that's oh. an obscure, funny concept like that. I mean, I, I swear, like, I, I come up with ideas for TV shows all the time that are always, like, the just most bizarre. Like, if you did this, this way it would be funny. I, I even develop, I developed, actually, uh, a show with Comedy Central um, uh, that was going to be a simulcast of the Oscars. You know how, like, they do, like, the, um, like, 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 they'll do well, the... explain what they used to do with the simulcast. Well, then, what they used to do, like, a, a thing where, they, they, you know, they'd be like, here's the State of the Union, and they're, and they're doing a sort of commentary on the State of the Union with, like, Jon Stewart and whatnot. My whole thing was, is like, and this was actually before he was doing that stuff. This is, like, in the mid-'90s. Um, in fact, they even ran ads for the show, and it was called Award This. And what we were going to do was... The, the, the whole idea was is that you would put the sh- this show, award this, in the picture-in-picture picture of your television. So you'd be watching the Oscars. This would come in picture-in-picture picture on your TV. During the actual award ceremony, you would see us doing, running silent commentary, doing jokes and holding up signs and stuff as the the the... Academy Awards is actually happening on your television. Oh, that's great. And then when it went to commercial break and when it went to any musical number, you would make the picture-in-picture of a Comedy Central fill up the full screen, and then we would have comedy bits. One of the bits was me, like, walking around Hollywood in a full tuxedo, holding an Oscar replica, hugging everyone, (laughs) homeless people, and just, yes! Yes! Woo! Yeah! So that's it for this week's bonus episode of Pod Crash. Hope you enjoyed it. You can uh, get more Proudly Resents, the cult movie podcast, by going to ProudlyResents.com. Uh, you can also follow uh, Adam Spiegelman and his podcast at Proudly Resents on Twitter. Adam Spiegelman, a guy knows a ton about movies. Uh, is also a, a comedian himself, and and uh, the show's great because it, it it brings on comedians and interesting interesting people, movie geeks, to just talk about their guilty movie pleasures. I have way too many of them. I could do like fifteen more episodes of that show. Uh, so uh, I've got to thank Adam for that. He also does a, a, a podcast, Dream Tweet, which we, we've talked about here on Pod Crash. So, so check that out. Um, that's it. So uh, follow me on Twitter at that Chris Gore, the show at Pod Crash Show. Like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Pod Crash. And please, please go to iTunes, listen to the show, subscribe to the show, post a review. That helps us out a lot. And I have one final thing to say to you, and it's let's get out of here! Press it.
if you're still listening to this, you're probably a lot like me. You're the kind of person who stays through the end credits of a movie. We're a lot alike. I like you. For that, you shall be rewarded. Send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Podcrash with that Chris Gore, 5042 Wilshire Boulevard, PMB, 1500 Los Angeles, California, 90036. You will receive in return a surprise. And if you're one of the first three people to at reply on Twitter, let's get out of here. If you say that, you'll win a free DVD courtesy of me. It'll be a DVD of my choice, and it's probably going to be something that was just, well, sitting in a pile, and it's not that good. But, but, but I'll mail it to you, and it's free. And so how can you complain? Okay, that's it. Later.